Okay, hey. Um, so number 15 is a rational function, but it's kind of an easy one. You guys are definitely wanting to be a little more focused on a rational function more like number 18. This is a much denser, denser problem, definitely one that you're going to want to be more familiar with. But looking at this, this is still worth talking about. We know that with a numerator that's a constant and a denominator that is linear, we're definitely going to be looking at a graph that is just sort of your run-of-the-mill hyperbola. It's going to have one vertical asymptote, one horizontal, and the graph is going to fit in somewhere. So where? Well, you can see that the zero of the denominator is 4. So you know there's a vertical asymptote over here at 4. By the way, that also dictates our domain. Our domain is now all real numbers except for 4. Now there's a horizontal asymptote too, and we should remember that when the denominator has the greater degree, your horizontal asymptote is just automatically y equals 0. And that's going to dictate our range. Our range would be all reals except for 0. And then to find the shape of the graph, I would recommend you do a little t-chart or something. So we already know that 4 is where we're undefined. So you can pick a point left of 4, like 3. Plugging in 3 gives 3 over 1, so 3. So the point 3, 3 is on our graph. And that alone telegraphs that the whole branch is going to be up above the axis. But we could go to 5 and check that out too. That gives us 3 over negative 1, so that's negative 3. So if I go over to 5, I'm going to be down here at negative 3 which telegraphs that the entire branch lives there. So I can now pretty safely sketch in an okay looking hyperbola and I feel really confident that everything's in the right place. So my domain is good, my range is good, my graph is good. Um, now that I've got a graph to look at, I think it's safe to say that yes, f of x is one to one already, so its inverse will be a function, so there's no need to restrict this domain any further because we're already one to one because we passed that horizontal line test. So now we just get down to it. We have to um, actually find the inverse function. Can I shrink this? Mm -hmm. Pretty effectively. All right, so to find the inverse function, we're going to switch all the variables, which means f of x just becomes x. And this becomes 3 over 4 minus y. So now you would try to solve this. I just like to put this over 1 and I cross multiply. So it'll be x times 4 minus y. And that'll equal 1 times 3, which is 3. Now to start trying to get y alone, we got to resolve these parentheses. That means distributing the x. So you get 4x minus x times y. And that equals 3. So what you want now is any term that has y in it, we got to get it all alone. So any term with y, we would push to the other side. And any term that doesn't have y, we'll pull to the other side. So this 3, I'd subtract it from both sides. So it's now over here with the 4x. And the negative xy, I'm going to add it to both sides. So there's now a positive xy over here. And then from here, you can see that the only thing left to do is divide by that x. And that'll get y all alone. So apparently our inverse function is 4x minus 3 all over x. That is equal to our inverse function, a.k.a. y. That's it. And at this point, we could double check. Um, what's our domain going to be here? Well, the domain of f inverse is all reals, but not 0, because you can't divide by 0. And shockingly, that is exactly what our range was. So we know we're doing pretty well here. Um, what's the range of f inverse? Well, the range of a rational function is based off of, largely based off of, just where the um, horizontal asymptote is. And this guy's horizontal asymptote, since the numerator and denominator both have the same degree, you're going to take your leading coefficients and divide them. So 4 over 1 tells me that my horizontal asymptote is up here at 4. The 0 says that my vertical asymptote is here. 
Um, and then if we plotted a point or two, you could just plug in zero. No, zero is undefined. So plug in one and you get four minus three, which is one divided by one, which is one. So the point one, one, remember this is already four up here. One, one is on our graph. So we can sketch that in. There's one of my branches. The other branch really has to be over here. So I'll just sketch that in. But we can see that our range is all real numbers except for our horizontal asymptote, which we said would be at four over one, which is four. So our range for sure is all real numbers except for four. And that jibes, because that's our domain. Domain became range, range became domain. So everything's good. Um, the only thing left for us to do is um, prove this. So I'll scroll us down. I will do f composed with f inverse. We'll do f inverse composed with f. We might even remember the functions. Um, 3 over 4 minus x. And we found our inverse function to be 4x minus 3 over x. So when we're doing f composed with f inverse, it means we're taking this function and plugging it in here. That should be the easier way to go. It'll be 3 over 4 minus, and then a big placeholder, this entire function. So 4x minus 3 over x. So we've got to take this thing now and clean it up. Um, to clean it up, I would put this 4 over 1 and multiply by x over x so that we now have a common denominator. Then I'd take away these silly brackets that aren't doing anything. Then I would state that 4x minus 4x is 0. That cancels out. Um, now this minus is still kicking. We're still subtracting this whole binomial. So we're subtracting a negative 3, which is going to give us 3. So we're currently looking at 3 over 3 over x. And like I said, I still think your best bet here is make the numerator a fraction too. So it's 3 over 1 over 3 over x. And then um, think about just multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator, x over 3. That would get everything down there to cancel. And whatever you do down there, you'll do to the top too. Um, okay, so what just happened? By multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator, the entire denominator cancels. The 3's cross-reduce, the x's cross-reduce. And then in the numerator, these 3's cross-reduce. And we just end up with, you know, it would have been 3x over 3 with the 3's canceling, but it's just going to be x. Which is great because that's what we always wanted. We always want these compositions to boil down to x. So we just have to do it one more time. This time it's the harder one though because we're taking the original function. You got to cram it in for this x and this x. You got to make sure it plugs into both places. So if our outer shell is the inverse, then we're going to go 4, open some brackets, make some room, minus 3. And downstairs, we're going to open some brackets, make some room. Um, but we're now going to take the um, original function, plug it in. So it's 3 over 4 minus x. And then it's 3 over 4 minus x. Um, so what do we do? I guess we're multiplying through by 4. So we now have 12 over 4 minus x. And then we're subtracting 3 from that. Well, you know that 3 is going to need to be over 1. And you know we're going to need to generate a common denominator. So 4 minus x over 4 minus x. So that means that now that we've got a common denominator, we've got a big old numerator. We're going to be doing the 4 times 3, which is 12. And then that'll be minus 12, conveniently, and then plus x. So those are the three terms in our numerator. Downstairs, this there's nothing to do. It's just 3 over 4 minus x. Now, very conveniently, when your denominators are the same, you can just cancel them right out. What have I done? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What have I done? 
I hope you guys already see what I did. Um, did I write anything down wrong? Because this isn't about to turn to X, is it? I need another factor of 3. Oh, there's my factor of 3. Right? Yeah, I didn't distribute this 3 like a big dummy. That 3 distributes. So we're getting 12 minus 12 plus 3x. There's a 3 there. My bad. Um, so that means everything's good now because the 12 and the 12 will cancel out. And I'm now just looking at a 3x over a 3. And as soon as you cancel those 3x's, I mean those 3's, you get plain old x like we wanted. Um, so there's the composition that justifies that these functions truly are inverses of one another. Um, and then we're done. I think we did it all. All right. Ugh. I hope this was helpful. See you tomorrow.